Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Red Deer Art Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery. I'm Lynn LaCour, the Education Coordinator, and we have Dion Casas here with us to do a virtual tour on our new exhibit, Body Language, the Reawakening of Cultural Tattooing of the Northwest. So welcome, Dion. I will give Dion an official um, uh, introduction in a minute, but I just want to start off with some land acknowledgements. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play in the traditional territories of Treaty 6, the gathering place of the Cree, Sotu, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux, located north of the Red Deer River. We also live in the traditional grounds of Treaty 7, the gathering place of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Gainai, Gani, as well as Yehi, Nakota, and the Tsutsina Nations, the Métis, and all the people who make their homes in Treaty 7, south of the Red Deer River. So we are pleased to welcome this exhibition. It was delayed for many weeks. Uh, it's from the Bill Reed Gallery of, um, from Vancouver, which is located on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. We respectfully acknowledge that this exhibit comes to us from the land in which the Musqueam, Squamish, the Sail, Watooth, call home, and the Indigenous people, all the Indigenous people of the Northwest Coast, whose traditional and unceded territories that the gallery lives and works on. So, welcome Dion. We are really happy to have him here to do this virtual talk. I'll just give you a little bit about what's going to be happening. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dion. He's going to do a a uh, PowerPoint presentation on his works and talk about the exhibition. And then when he's done that, we're going to go live into the um, into the galleries and we're going to see the, have a little bit of a walk and talk and see the exhibit. And uh, Dion will talk about some key pieces. At the end, we will have a question and discussion. So if you have any questions throughout, you can uh, type them into the chat and we will discuss them at the end. And while we're live going through the walk and talk into the galleries, if you have any questions, type them in, we'll read them and answer them as best we, as we can during the live talk. So this exhibit is both a historic and contemporary journey of cultural tattooing of the Northwest Coast. Dion Casas is a tattoo artist, a cultural tattoo practitioner, a painter, a teacher, and a scholar of Hungarian Métis and Inklapkapama, sorry for the pronunciation, nation, which is Interior Salish. Dion has a master's degree in Indigenous Studies at the University of BC from Kelowna. He has been tattooing since 2009. Dion and two other artists have started Earthline Tattoo Collective in 2015. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Skin Deep Magazine, The World Atlas of Tattoo, Tattoo Traditions of North Native North America, and most recently the television series Skindigenous, which premiered in 2018 on the Aboriginal People's Television Network and USA Inc. on Fox Nation. So Dion has been invited to international tattoo festivals in Spain, New Zealand, Samoa, and across Canada. So we are so excited to have him here talking to us about this really exciting exhibit. Uh, Dion has also uh, guest curated this exhibit. There are four other artists in this exhibit, Corey Bulput, uh, who's Haida Nation, from Haida Nations, Dean Hunt, Heltzik, uh, Nahan, who's Tlingit, and Nikita Tremble, which is Niska. So all five of these contemporary artists are exhibiting. They have been researching and reclaiming the traditional techniques of their nations and building awareness of the significance of protocols and tattooing traditions and the community of cultural tattooing practitioners in the Northwest continues to grow. So welcome Dion, we are Thank happy you. to have you. So, Awesome, thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to uh, share a little bit about this exhibition and also my work. Uh, I'm just gonna get my uh, presentation up here and then we'll get rolling. So just bear with me as I get that all sorted out. Um, and, All right, I think we are up. All right, so uh, thank you. My name is Dion Kazas. I'm a Hungarian Métis and Inthakat cultural tattoo practitioner, ancestral skin marker, uh, scholar, and podcaster. Uh, just uh, this is going to be a you know whenever I present, I always 
provide way more slides than I need. So, you know, I don't, I don't actually know where we're going to end up. So I may decide to skip a slide or I may uh, decide to um, uh, explore something a little bit greater or uh, deeper than what's in the slide, but we'll end up where we end up. And just remember, you know, uh, if you don't agree with something that I say, let's just leave it at that. We don't agree and move on to the next thing. So uh, welcome to Body Language, a Reflection After Five Years. And so the reason I uh, present this, uh, uh, this presentation as a reflection after five years is that we actually uh, curated this exhibition in through 2017 and it opened in 2018 at the Bill Reed Gallery in Vancouver. And so it's been traveling since that time to a variety of locations. And I'm super excited that there has been such a great interest in this work. But um, I just wanted to share, uh, you know, where I am from. So I'm in Tlacotmoc Territory in uh, South Central British Columbia. So it's always important to acknowledge where I'm from, where I come from. And um, yeah. So again, acknowledge the Bill Reed Gallery for uh, helping in the curation of this exhibition, Body Language, Reawakening Cultural Tattooing of the Northwest. As you can see, it was originally uh, there from June 8th, 2018 to January 13th, 2019. So this exhibition was co-curated with uh, Beth Carter uh, at the Bill Reed Gallery. And uh, I'm so uh, stoked that Beth uh, you know, reached out and asked me to curate this exhibition uh, with my friends and colleagues from the Northwest. So uh, I just want to introduce the uh, artists that are part of this exhibition, starting from uh, the left of the screen is Nikita Trimble, who is Nishka. And I was excited to have uh, Nikita uh, here, you know, one of the first wave revivalists of indigenous tattooing in Canada and Turtle Island, but specifically for her nation, uh, did a lot of work uh, with her elders in the Nishka uh, El Count Council of Elders. And then uh, Corey Bolpit is a uh, Haida Carver and uh, a student of Nahan. Uh, Nahan is a Clinket um, cultural tattoo practitioner, Carver and language uh, speaker. Then of course there's myself. And then Dean Hunt is a Heltzik, uh Carver, uh, you know, comes from a very long family of carvers uh, who do amazing master carvings, uh, all, all of his family, his dad and his brother and himself. And so the reason I put this as the curatorial steering committee is the reality is, is that this exhibition is made up of uh, material from com communities that are not my own. And so as an Incomic person, I don't necessarily have the rights relationship and responsibility to speak about Kalinkit things or Heltzik things or Haida things. And so it was important for me to gather all of us together. And uh, this was in Whistler. We gathered together as a curatorial steering committee to ask the simple question, you know, what is appropriate for us to share? what is not appropriate for us to share and how would uh, you like to present your uh, community's uh, ancestral skin marking practice. And so, you know, it was a curatorial steering committee. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't just curated by myself and Beth, but each of the artists also contributed to the presentation of the exhibition body language. Um, and we were supported by the Canada Council for the Arts, so always important to be able to, uh, you know, give uh, credit where credit is due. And Canada Council helped bring us all together for this curatorial steering committee meeting in Whistler. And so you can see us all having a conversation in Beth, uh, you know, writing notes as we discussed the variety of things that were important to us. And I would just like to honor those that support my work personally. Um, you can check all of these people out on um, their Instagram. So their Instagram handle is up there. 
if you're interested. So this is Billie Jean Gabriel, who is a photographer and has documented a lot of the work that I have done over the years. And so I just like to hold up all of those who support the work that I do. Um, uh, Tunasa is also a photographer who has documented a lot of my work. So if you, I would encourage you to go check them out on uh, Instagram, give them a follow and a like and all of that type of stuff. And, you know, maybe hire them to do some photography for your next event. And then uh, also uh, Wes Wilson uh, is my brother-in-law, but an amazing photographer who does a lot of work as well. So go give him a follow and uh, support him. And then Aaron Leon uh, is a SEAL or Okanagan um, uh, photographer. Again, go follow him, uh, give him, uh, give him a like and all that support. Then I always like to bring forward, you know, uh, as I have traveled this journey of uh, doing ancestral skin marking and uh, cultural tattooing, a lot of times the practitioner or the person who is doing the marking is uh, held up and honored. Uh, but the reality is it's important to honor those that wear the marks uh, because we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do without those people who wear these marks into the world. And when I say that, you know, uh, that's actually truly the hard work of showing up as an Indigenous person uh, in a variety of places, sometimes places that are hostile to you as an Indigenous person. And so important to honour those that wear the marks. And I'm just going to quickly uh, go through a variety of photos uh, of folks who are wearing the marks. And they were taken, uh, the photos were taken primarily by Billie Jean Gabriel. Uh, here's an example of one of the photo shoots that we did um, to document some of my own work. And so the name is on the bottom of the slide, and I'm not really going to comment. I'm just going to let you uh, see them and uh, admire their beautiful marks. So I'm, so I'm using, sorry about that. So I'm using an Inthlakatmuk weaving methodology. And what this means is that I'm going to be sharing a variety of stories and a variety of uh, information. And it's up to you to weave your own knowledge basket. You know, we each have our own uh, way of interpreting things, our own experiences and our own understanding of how we view the world. And so, you know, when it comes to the end of this presentation, you may feel that I haven't uh, circled all the way back, but those are your uh, relationships to build with that knowledge. If there's questions, you know, still lingering, maybe you need to do some research, but uh, it'll be up to you to weave your own knowledge basket from this presentation and from the exhibition. Um, so I'm just using, uh, like to acknowledge that, that, you know, we're talking story and uh, sometimes that goes in the circle and it's important for you to weave that knowledge with your own understanding. So, you know, when I think about my own work, uh, it's important to ask the question, what got me into tattoos initially? Uh, and that was actually my two uncles, my uncle Tony and my uncle Ernie uh, had these tattoos respectively. Um, you know, as I was growing up, I always seen them and I always thought they were so cool. Um, and so th that's kind of the main start of what got me into tattoos in a general sense. And then how did I get into ancestral skin marking is the next question. You know, um, when I think about uh, this exhibition, I won't be really touching too much on uh, the ancestral knowledge of the Northwest Coast. Um, because those are not my communities, that's not my culture, that's not my knowledge. And so I just like to talk about the knowledge that I have rights, relationship, and responsibility to. And uh, this will be specifically, I'll specifically be talking about Inthlakatmok marking, skin marking, and tattooing. And I'll share a little bit about uh, Northwest Co Coast, Haida, Clinket. Uh, Heltzik and Nishka tattooing, but in a very general sense. 
And so how did I get into ancestral skin markings? And this story starts in 2006 when I was going to get work done on this right culturally appropriated Maori sleeve. And I always say that uh, because I think it's important to highlight the fact that we only know what we know, you know. And so, yes, I have a sleeve that's culturally appropriated. Um, do I feel shame about it? No, but it's always interesting when I go to New Zealand and my Maori friends look at it with a little bit of a, you know, a half cocked eye, like what's going on there? Um, but yes, uh, we only know what we know. And so once you know better, you do better. Anyways, in 2006, I was going to get work done on the sleeve and I, um, you know, I was sorting through all the magazines and I came across this little booklet, uh, Tattooing Face and Body Painting of the Thompson Indians by James Tate. And, you know, it was at that time that I didn't even realize that we as Inthakatmuk or Thompson Indians is the name that was given to us. We as Inthakatmuk people uh, had a tattooing practice. And so I always say that my head just about popped off and, you know, I thought to myself, hey, I can do a uh, master's research on this. But the reality is, is that I wasn't, didn't have an undergrad. I didn't have a BA or I wasn't in an undergrad. So it was, uh, you know, just an interesting thought at that time to say, oh, I can do master's research on this. Um, anyways, uh, as time went on, I actually went back to university at UBC Okanagan in 2008, I believe. And I walked into a course called, um, a course with uh, Dr. Jeanette Armstrong, a SEAL or Okanagan uh, knowledge keeper. And uh, Jeanette shared the story of the four food chiefs. And I'm told that this story can take a couple days to uh, be told, but I'm only gonna share a, a brief piece of it that relates to this conversation. And that is that, you know, in the time before this time, and so what that means is before us as humans came into this plane of existence, the creator came to the animal people and asked them, what will you do for the people to be? And of course, that's an important question uh, because we as animals, we're not well adapted to our environment. We can't run fast. We don't have sharp claws. We don't have fur to keep us warm. Uh, we can't gather nutrients from the ground or the sun. And so we need a lot of help to survive in our environment. And so the creator asked, what will you do for the people to be? And that's as far as I'm going to go in that story, because that's the question that I feel that the creator asks to all of us. And that's the question that sat on my heart uh, since the time that I heard that question. And so as I moved through uh, my education, I started my tattoo apprenticeship in 2009. And so this is a photo of me uh, tattooing my own knee uh, back in the day in the tattoo shop that I originally started at, Vertigo Tattoos, uh, which uh, my mentor, Carla Romanuk. So a big shout out to Carla. Thank you for, you know, giving sharing this knowledge with me on how to tattoo. Uh, safely and with the huge emphasis on health. But started my apprenticeship in 2009 and I started to look out across the globe to Indigenous nations uh, and found out what the revival of their cultural tattooing and ancestral skin marking was doing for them. And so I'm just going to share some videos. Hopefully uh, they come through clearly and you can get a sense of what those and other nations and communities uh, think about the revival of their ancestral tattooing, which I took many lessons from them. So this is a, a video of Tihoti, uh, who was from Tahiti, and he'll be sharing about the revival of Tahitian tattooing. Take many years to find where's the connection. You need to use a connection to that symbol they're going to put on your body. Because for us, you don't tattoo on your skin, <clears throat> spirit too, because it's on you, on life. So it's important to carry what you believe and connect it. I love my culture, I love my ancestors, and I connect with them for life. Make my identity know who I am. The intention, I intention, I'm descended. So I keep going down in these crazy fights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So um, I'll be sharing video clips throughout um, just to give you a sense of the depth of uh, the revival of Indigenous tattooing and also to share a variety of voices. Because the reality is the knowledge that I have has come from the relationships, the conversations and the people that I've talked to, heard from or watched either on uh, documentary films and or read in books. So I'll be sharing a variety of voices to give a fuller context and depth to Indigenous ancestral skin marking. And so uh, I started to gather pieces of coyote or pieces of knowledge related to uh, Inthakatmuk uh, ancestral skin marking uh, you know, beginning in 2010, I went into a course called, um, uh, and what was it? Uh, Indigenous Historical Perspectives with my mentor, Margot Tamez, who is Lee Pan Apache. And she uh, asked me to start researching something that I was interested coming from my own nation and culture. And so I remembered back from 2006, I thought about that paper. And of course, that little booklet written by James Tate, I didn't write down the title, I didn't write down the author. So I had to do a little bit of digging to find that booklet once again, and I wrote a paper on it. And so I started gathering knowledge and information about Inthakatmuk uh, ancestral skin marking at that time. And here is another video uh, a, about the revival of Maori tattooing and the experience of that uh, in New Zealand. My grandfather died in 1958, and at that point I was four years old. Now, in my mind, everything stopped. The death of my grandfather had such a traumatic effect on me that I stopped speaking Māori, which was my first language. Completely denied, if you like, unconsciously, that part of me. Being brought up in the Mormon church, you were a Mormon and you weren't a Māori, and rightly or wrongly, that's how I felt right up until I was 13. I think that subconsciously I've always wanted to have a Mormon. Having left the Mormon church, having made that decision to be more Māori, to take up an active political struggle, it just was a natural progression to stumble upon Mōko. So the yearning was awakened, and having awakened that yearning, it became a need to actually um, move it from a yearning to a reality. I had made the decision on a Saturday morning and called my mother, and she said, oh no, Manu, she said just in that tone, if God wanted you to have that, you would have been born with it. And I said to her, well, if God wanted you to have clothes, you would have been born with those as well. To which she replied, don't be stupid to me. <laughs> so we had it here. It was important that I had the people that mattered most around me. There were about 70 people in our home throughout the whole weekend, coming and going. and So it was a big celebration, a weekend of celebration, where we laughed and cried and had lots of fun and lots of anguish about how it is that we just about lost this art form. And then there was the jubilation of rekindling it in our own particular family. It was absolutely wonderful. I think it was my rebirthing. Because as I sat up after I had been completed, there was this overwhelming sense of rebirth. Just, um, I sat up and the tears just flowed. I sobbed, literally sobbed. <clears throat> and so uh, beginning in that time in 2010, I started to uh, look at documentary films. I began to read papers and came to understand the power of uh, ancestral skin marking. And uh, one quote that really stands out to me is L. Frank Manriquez 
who was a two-spirit uh, Tongvana Jokma elder from California, speaks about how when they received their triple 11, that when she reached, it was like when she sat up, she reached hands across time and held hands with her long past aunties, uh, grandmothers and great grandmothers and brought them into the present. And so in 2010, I uh, was a kickboxing instructor and one of the young men who was in my kickboxing class actually decided to um, decided to take his own life and he decided to no longer be with us in this plane of existence. And I say that um, the culmination of the revival of Inthakatmuk tattooing and the birth of it started in with the seeds that were planted in 2006. And I cultivated that earth. And then it was the, my tears at my young friend's funeral who began to water uh, that seed that was planted in 2006. And I realized that it was my responsibility to revive uh, Inthakatmuk tattooing because I knew uh, how to tattoo properly and safely, uh, dealing with bloodborne pathogens and cross contamination. I knew the power of uh, the power of the revival of ancestral tattooing, and I knew that our people, uh, our young people, very specifically, uh, were like uh, seaweeds without roots. L. Frank says, and that uh, L. Frank also shares that our tattoos are a way of anchoring our youth uh, to today. And so I always share, uh, and I share very intimately in the uh, documentary film that's part of this exhibition that uh, if you know, our tattoos help to keep our youth here for one more uh, year, another uh, month, another week, uh, another day, uh, another minute, or another second, then that work is important work to uh, keep them here. And so I had this hunch that our tattooing had the power to keep our youth here and to give us a sense of our identity and who we are and had a very powerful way of connecting us to this plane of existence. And so, you know, the research has gone on and I've understood that, uh, you know, uh, the revival of cultural aspects of indigenous culture do that have a protective uh, effect on uh, youth against suicide. And so I just wanted to bring that forward because that's really the beginning of this work. And so I began uh, the process of hand poking and skin stitching in 2012. So picking up those ancestral tools and technology and beginning that work. So there's evidence of the earliest tattooing, which comes from a discovery in Europe of several instruments that were used for tattooing between 10,000 BC and 38,000 BC. Aaron Dieter Wolf and his colleagues comment that indigenous cultures from every continent except Antarctica included tattooing as an essential element of their cultural fabric. And I'm just going to share a few historic photos of Haida tattooing, uh, crest tattoos that were documented uh, during those contact times. Here is uh, Corey Bullpit. Uh, Haida, and uh, here's a clip from a bit of the documentary film that's part of this exhibition. On a daily basis, you know, where the tattoos become a daily basis thing that remind you of who you are. You know, you, know, you can essentially stop, you know, I think, stop like suicide and different things that are big problems. You know. You know, through having that kind of bond with each other, you know, like you could maybe look at your arm, oh yeah, I'm part of this, and I can go talk to my my clan or go talk to my people that could understand me, you know. So I think it can heal us in, in other ways, you know, that are more uh, problems of nowadays, you know, using something old to fix a new problem. Another uh, photo of Haida crest tattoos. Uh, Dean Hunt sharing uh, about uh, Heltzik tattooing and his experience. I look at it like it's we're reclaiming or, or reawakening um, that spirit that's always been 
in us. Uh, it just it went deeper in the skin. So uh, we're trying to I feel like bring that back out. And and there's a sense of pride and a sense of uh, uh, gratitude on my part for being uh, able to do that work and be able to uh, offer that back to to my community, my home community of Bella Bella and Waglista. Um, so that's that's basically number one is is just reclaiming that that power that's that's always been there and uh, just bringing it back out, you know, because all the crests they live on us still they're in our hearts and our our souls. So we uh, to be able to do that, you know, and be able to put that in there permanently, so the uh, so the ancestors can can recognize us when we finish our time here is, is very important for <clears throat> so uh again i want to talk about rights relationship and responsibilities uh when i talk about this i'm really talking about cultural appropriation you know this is a conversation that always comes up especially when you're looking at the beautiful and powerful designs of indigenous ancestral skin marking and very specifically the uh, ancestral tattooing practices of the Haida, Heltzik, Nishka, and uh, Clinket peoples, and all of those Northwest Coast people who practice form line, what has been uh, commonly given the phrase or the categorization of um, form line is that those are, you know, uh, it's important that we only tattoo on ourselves or offer tattoos to uh, the, we have rights relationship and responsibilities too. And I always break this down in a very simple way that one of the people in that equation of getting a tattoo or receiving a tattoo has to have rights relationship and responsibilities to those marks, designs, patterns, and motifs. And so when I say that, it could be the person who's receiving them uh, has the rights relationship and responsibility to that clan uh, crest uh, design, a form line design, or the practitioner has the rights relationship and responsibilities to it. And so uh, a lot of times I will tattoo from my own ancestral visual language, and I'm the one who has rights relationship and responsibilities to those patterns, designs, and motifs. And so there is no cultural appropriation there because I'm offering it as a gift to the receiver uh, from me and my culture. And so, you know, when I tattoo whoever, regardless of their background, uh, if I'm giving designs from my own community, um, I'm the one who hold those rights, relationship, and responsibilities. It becomes cultural appropriation when uh, neither of those people have rights, relationship, and responsibility to those designs, patterns, and motifs. And so that's where the cultural appropriation comes in. And so when I put this photo up here, you might be wondering why is there a photo of this beautiful uh, glacial lake in the Stein Valley Traverse? This is Tundra Lake, and it's a beautiful uh, part of the Stein Valley Traverse that I've hiked numerous times from uh, Lillooet Lake to Lytton over the coastal mountains. But these uh, rights, relationships, and responsibility and cultural appropriation starts with our connection to these lands, territories, and the places that we get our ancestral knowledge from. And so it's important to bring that forward at this point. Uh, here is Nikita Trimble talking about uh, the connection that she has with her ancestral skin marking practice. <clears throat> so I can speak to my house and my crest um, only. I can share those stories with you. Um, I have no authority to share anyone else's stories on their house crests. Um, so what I was told was, uh, during the last major flood about 10,000 years ago, uh, the Niska, Tsimsian, and Gitzan all lived at the top of this mountain. And that mountain was called Tamlachan. And it was a it was a great city, this mountain. Um, and the water began to, to move down slowly. And the people began to migrate down with that water. And it, the water eventually formed the Nass, the Skeena, and the Stikine River. 
um, and our people moved along along that river. And when that water came down, the people talked about um, this language being written on the earth. And it was a gift from the creator. And we call that language artwork today. But this form line, these ovoids and U shapes were written down and the people took that as a gift from the creator. And one of those crests that were gifted uh, was the frog crest, was, was my family's crest. Um, and so it's one of the oldest crests that we have today. <laughs> <clears throat> and so uh, with that in mind, uh, you know, you may ask me questions when we get to the question period, and I may not be able to answer them, uh, even if I have that knowledge, because I don't have the relationship to that knowledge. And therefore, without that relationship, I don't have the right to share uh, those stories. And so I'm going to continue to share about Intlakatmuk tattooing, and uh, me as an interior Salish was added to this exhibition as a counterpoint to Northwest Coast tattooing uh, because our cultures are so varied and so vast and different, uh, even though we all come from uh, the nation state of Canada and specifically the province of British Columbia, what has now been called British Columbia. So here are some examples of uh, Intlakatmuk skin marking, and this is fan of a bird's tail on a chin. This is actually a seal or Okanagan design uh, with rain falling. And I'm not going to talk through all of these designs, but I'm just sharing uh, so you can get a sense of some of the patterns, designs, and motifs. So in Chikatmuk skin marking practices, uh, you know, at one time, no one past the age of puberty was without a skin marking. Some went where on his, her, or their body. Most tattooing started at puberty, though occasionally ornamental designs were done around eight years of age. Uh, first, uh, one of the first reasons we as Intocopic marked our skin was conducted, was connected to adornment or ornamentation among young people in order to make themselves more pleasing to potential partners. And so I always find it important to highlight this that, you know, uh, a lot of times we always try to emphasize that, uh, you know, a tattoo has to have a meaning. Tattoo has to be, you know, have a, sweet, uh, a very deep spiritual story connected to it. But, you know, if it was good enough for our ancestors to adorn themselves and ornament themselves, I think we should uh, have the uh, same uh, feeling about our own ancestral skin marking. Sometimes uh, being beautiful is just good enough of a reason. The second reason was in connection to marriage. Thirdly, our tattooing was associated with puberty and the acquiring of our spiritual guardians. Fourthly, we practiced tattooing in connection with dreaming and the guardian spirits to ward off death and cure sickness. And I feel it's really important to uh, highlight the fact that our ancestors had this knowledge that uh, tattooing could be used as a medical epistemology or a medical knowledge uh, to cure us of a variety of things. And so it's important to highlight that because we talk about our ancestral skin marking practices as tattoo medicine. And so finally, tattoos were used for identification. And so ancestral tools and technology for skin marking. We had hand poking tools uh, made of bone, thorn, porcupine quills, cactus spine, or rock to poke or prick. Uh, and then we had skin stitching tattoos, uh, which skin stitching is exactly what it sounds like. It's a needle with a piece of thread, or back in the day it was bone needle and sinew. And uh, you poke it underneath the skin and then take it a few millimeters and bring it out of the skin. And so it creates a tunnel filled with ink. So uh, the pigment we used for hand poking and skin, skin stitching consisted of red ochre, yellow ochre, and charcoal. Occasionally, the ancestors made this charcoal from devil's club root, and this is said to create a bluish colored tattoo. Um, you know, this is an important uh, conversation to have because you can see that in the past, our ancestors had a very vibrant tattooing practice, and we, um, you know, to the point that nobody in Intakotmok Nation was without a ancestral skin mark at the age of puberty or beyond. 
And so here is uh, Corey Bulpit sharing the story of a uh, one of the final Haida elders who wore ancestral Haida skin markings. And uh, Maggie Yaltat, she was Florence's sister's husband's sister, was one of the last people tattooed, Florence says. She was real ashamed of the tattoos on her hands. She used to wear gloves to hide them whenever she went out. I wonder why they let them do this to me, she used to say. So this was at a time of uh, Christianity and where, uh, you know, uh, basically the old things had been uh, taken out of us by the potlatch ban, by, uh, you know, uh, residential schools by that time. And, uh, you know, we're, during her time, it was, it was, uh, you know, they, they were speaking English and it wasn't even a thought to speak, learn Haida anymore for a while, you know, they still held certain things, you know, they, there were certain potlatches and things and things even eventually in her lifetime, you know, Robert Davidson initiated doing a totem pole again. And, you know, there was small thing. there was things going on you know, it was very underground in a lot of senses, and frowned upon by the government for us to uh, to be Haida and to live our lives as Haida people. They were a threat to them and everything they wanted to take from us, you know, and continue to take. So, uh, you know, the shame of that woman, you know, it wasn't necessarily her being ashamed, I think, of who she was as a Haida, but just that uh, Christian valued shame. Brought so part of the erasure of uh, Northwest tattooing on the Northwest coast was due to missionization and the erasure of, uh, erasure of our cultures. Uh, part of this, of course, was residential schools. Uh, the Indian Act and the uh, the Gradual Civilization Act is the precursor to the Indian Act, uh, which really uh, highlights the reality of what that act is about, is the erasing of Indigenous peoples, uh, Indian people, and uh, the nation state's responsibility to dealing fairly with us. Uh, the process of enfranchisement, and diseases was another reason why our tattoos went out of, uh, you know, uh, declined. And I would say that it's important to highlight the reality or the context of cultural appropriation, because too often cultural appropriation is put within the context of um, intellectual property, you know, all of these Western constructions of how to deal with uh, artistic creation. But for me, cultural appropriation starts from a culture of genocide. And so cultural appropriation with, starts with the theft of land. And it is based on assuming you have rights to things that aren't yours. And so this is highlighted in this photo or this painting uh, with the doctrine of discovery and the planting of a flag to claim that this is their land. Um, we're going to skip that one uh, just because we're running down on time. Uh, but the potlatch ban was something that uh, was put forward through the Indian Act and uh, made it illegal for people on the Northwest Coast to practice the essential form or the essential place that uh, ancestral skin marking took place was at the potlatch. Um, and then I'm just going to quickly run through some slides here as I'm winding down. Again, I said, uh, you know, I put more in here than we're going to get through, so we might skip through uh, some of these uh, slides. So ancestral tools and technology. So all of these tattoos were done using skin stitch or hand poke. Uh, we're going to skip this video. So I'm just going to share them. You can see them experience them visually, but I'm not going to comment on them. I'm going to share this video of Rosanna Raymond 
who is a Samoan artist, and uh, she shares about the reality of Samoan tattooing. I mean, if if you look at the word tatao, it is you know ta is time, tao is to hold on. It is literally holding on to time. So it, it's not just about the you know that we decorated our bodies. It, it's it, it's a way of allowing the past to to be in the present because you know we are the genealogical matter of the past and present and and the way that it converges into the now. And that's what we talk about when we mean that these things are living to us. We don't Just seeing how I'm looking in the mirror going, like they, they could see themselves, their reflection already, their real selves, you know, the mana, the ancestors. They could see themselves being the ancestors, how happy they are. Like it's alive. That thing, that whole thing was alive. So I could, I could feel it, but wasn't awake yet. You know, like how, like how a dream is. You know, you keep just going along with a dream, you know, until it wakes you up. So I could see that happening and it fueled me more. I'm like, oh, there. So this is El Festin of the Mark of the Four Waves tribe, an American Filipino uh, group working on the revival of uh, Filipino tattooing. And uh, El is talking about watching people as they get their ancestral marks and seeing themselves appear. Um, just gonna share a few more slides and uh, then we can start moving towards the uh, gallery exhibition. So there's always this question of protocols uh, we didn't get as far as I was hoping, but that's all right. We got where we got. Uh, this is a good place to start winding down towards that uh, sharing. I'll just share a few more slides. So who can get the work done? This is always a question, you know, that comes forward. And I have this picture up because in 2015, my friend Nahan and I went to visit Mark Kapuya, who is a... Uh, one of the first wave revivalists of Maori tattooing in Aotearoa. And uh, when we were there, he asked us this question, you know, who can get the work? And so at that time I had a really staunch, you know, strict idea of who could get the tattoos that, that I was doing. And he shared, and this is the way that I understood what he shared is that they had this conversation back in the day. And during that time, they came to the realization that, you know, in the beginning of a revival movement, it's like uh, the neck of a bottle. And, you know, it's really uh, easy to squeeze off the energy of that work that's being done by being too strict. And so they, they came up with the phrase Moko the world. And so that's really the way that, uh, you know, that I see that this work is it's important to give as many people who have rights relationship and responsibility to those marks to give it to them. Uh, and we will build as uh, Mark shared a critical mass of people and that this practice will become a self uh, regulating process, which is, uh, has, is beginning to happen. And I know there's friends and colleagues who are uh, Maori and they do Uhi work and hand tapping, uh, the ancestral tapping of the Maori people. Uh, but they say, I, I can't get my facial moko because I don't uh, speak my language well enough. And so as we move forward, it's important to uh, give people, the people who have the rights relationship and responsibility, the marks that they deserve. And we will build that critical mass to the point where we, uh, where this work will be important, not as a revival movement, but simply as another part of our ancestral practices. You know, I hope to one day get to the point where uh, we will just be tattooing because that's what you do when you come of age. You know, when you uh, go through your ceremony that brings you into adulthood, you will go get marked. And that will be the beautiful place where this is just part of what we do, not something special because we're doing the work of reviving it. And that's where my dream is. And that's where I always hope to go to. Um, Nahan shares this uh, comment, uh, comment when we were sharing uh, the curatorial steering committee. 
And it's important to highlight the facts that he's putting forward. Yeah, for sure. We battle every day just to be who we are, just to maintain and be, be alive as indigenous people, man. There's some crazy statistics that we are at the forefront of every day. And that means and just the fact that we're working to deny those for our communities, for each other. It's like, yeah, it's, that's the war every day that we wake up. We've got to realize that. And that's, that's what it is. So, you know, and so being able to look at that, like, yeah, like, you know, the warrior marks or, or things like that, mm-hmm. how does that apply to what the person is doing now? Yeah. And, and how do we convey that for that person? And I- My friend Jody Potts, who's a uh, uh, Gwich'in uh, practitioner, ancestral skin marker, shared the story of Sometimes people will come, uh, women will come to get their facial tattoos and they'll say, "Uh, I don't deserve this. I haven't done enough to earn the right to wear these. And she says, you know, you have uh, lived to this far in your life. You've fought those battles and you are enough. You are enough of a reason to get those marks uh, because you're here. And it's a celebration of the resilience of your ancestors struggle to ensure that you're here and so that is i think where i'm going to leave my presentation for today um and we can uh move towards the uh gallery uh tour you know there's a lot more to say but there's always a lot more to say so keep an eye out i'll be sharing again somewhere in the world and hopefully you can hear about some of the other exciting stuff that's coming up in my work and i'm just gonna sign off from this presentation. Thank you, Dion. That was excellent. Um, I can see that Kim is in the galleries and she'll start to walk around. I don't know if we have anybody online right now. So I think um, you can just go ahead with your presentation. I do have many questions for you now after that um, fantastic uh, explanation of so many things. Uh, But I will hold those to the end. All right. So uh... You know, this is a, as we're walking through, you can kind of see this is uh, Nikita's uh, area in the exhibition. And Six Knox is the uh, word that Nikita, that uh, Nishka people use for tattooing. Uh, You know, there is a lot of beautiful sharing that Nikita shares about uh, Six Knox and that journey in um, the exhibition. So you should go check that out. Um, I don't know that I have enough depth of knowledge to share intelligently about that word, Um, but the panel that we just passed is uh, the piece that Nikita did, and it's a carving telling the story of her uh, clan and the frogs and the uh the lava that uh the ancestral story about the lava beds in Nishka territory so go check that out it's a beautiful carved panel uh and the story is there on the wall uh again uh important to hear those words from nikita and the things that she has put forward there and so we're moving here to dean hunt and helzik tattoo revival the it's really cool piece that uh, Dean uh, shared with us in the exhibition. It's his imagining of what a Heltzik or a Formline uh, Northwest Coast bodysuit might look like. And so he just shared this imagining to uh, give inspiration for Northwest Coast people to take and use as a framework for the creation of Northwest Coast uh, bodysuit tattooing. And just some photos of uh, Dean's work as he has moved uh, through the journey that he has been taking. Uh, Here's uh, my stuff. I think we've heard enough about me, but uh, there's a medicine painting that I did based on our uh, face painting and some of the design symbols and motifs. And there's an explanation of what that fully uh, is talking about. So go down to the gallery and check it out. It's important to see all of these things in person and to read the uh, didactic panels that are there. Uh, Here's uh, Corey Bullpit and his uh, work into the revival of Haida tattooing. 
Um, Corey did a beautiful painting uh, talking about the uh, love for salmon and the resistance against um, uh, commercial uh, farms, salmon farms, etc. So it's a beautiful piece to, piece to go check out. Um, here is a uh, mask. I believe uh, Corey uh, carved this mask, and it is about the um, the an original ancestor who had tattoos. And the one of the uh, stories, one of the beautiful creation stories of the Haida people, uh, with the first tattooed uh, Haida. And you can see in there uh, librette in the lip. So it's a pretty powerful piece. Um, we're going here to Nahan and the Clinket Tattoo Revival. Uh, Nahan shares some beautiful photos of the work that he did, uh, tattooing that he'd done on uh, people in land defense and resistance movements in um, all across the uh all across Turtle Island. Uh, here's some librettes or uh, some pieces that he did, nose uh, pieces that he carved based on some designs found in the Burke Museum, I believe. Um, so some beautiful septum pieces uh, that he carved, uh, bringing that embodiment forward. And so uh, here's a, a a provocative piece that most people are drawn to uh, that Nahan put forward. And he uh, recreated many of the hand tattoos that he found in uh, his research in Clinket tattooing. And it's also a piece that talks about the erasure and the stopping of uh, clinket tattooing in uh, his community. And you can see the hand on the top has a cross and then it has some uh, pock marks on it. And so that's to represent the smallpox that took, took away a large amount of the people uh, from the Northwest coast. And then you also see on there, um, it's also connected to a story, uh, one of his ancestral stories. And we have in the middle here, um, this is the uh, Haida kit, tattoo kit, that was created, recreated by Corey Bullpit, uh, based on uh, tools that are found in the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, we have some ochre and some charcoal in there to show and represent uh, some of those ancestral pigments. And then we also have the face stamps, which Nahan... Uh, recreated uh, based on some, I think, patterns found at the Burke Museum. And so these were actually used in, or similar to this, were used in potlatch to put the clan and crest symbols uh, and face paint on those involved in the potlatch. So Dion, I, yes. I have a question. And Kim, can you bring us back to the... Um the sculpture, the halt of our tattooing, the hand sculpture. Um, while we were on it, I had a question on that that I might as well ask you while we're there. Uh, yeah. This is a very powerful piece about uh, colonization. Now, in the story, it's I know Nahan had said it's an interpretation, sort of the origins behind the tattoo. There was yeah. sort of a story of a woman finding a bent wood box of tattooed hands. Uh, so was that actually based on uh, an origin story or was that actually based on some some historical facts? No, that was I'm not sure about the you know, I would say that, you know, it's an interesting question. And I think that the origin story for us actually speaks of historical fact. And so I would say, you know, part of that when I answer questions about this, people will say, well, was that true or did that really happen? And for me, it's irrelevant whether it happened. It, it's it. The reality is, is that it changes the way that we see the world. And so it is true in the truest sense of what that is. And it's hard for us to know whether that, you know, happened in linear time. But I would say as an Indigenous person, our, uh, our stories talk to us and tell us about the reality of our world. Um, and I would say that, it, you know, it was written down by John R. Swanton in 1904, and it was told by a clan leader 
and I cannot say the name, uh, but yes, it was recorded by John R. Swanton, the story, the creation story that uh, this original piece was based on uh, with the Bentwood box. Okay, thank you. That sort of was my understanding of it. It was based on so, sort of historic events, but not so yes. literal as yes. so many people would like to take it. Um, so since the creation of this exhibit and having it tour to so many galleries, have you seen an increase in more Indigenous communities embracing their their uh, their cultural traditions and tattoo techniques? Yes, you know, uh, it is such a powerful reality to follow. Um, you know, uh, I can remember us gathering and the reality was that, you know, there was only, you know, us in that room pretty much were the first ones who were starting this revival movement. And so, you know, the three of us, Nahan, uh, Nikita and myself, you know, were kind of in that first wave of the revival of ancestral skin marking here in the nation state of Canada and Turtle Island. And so it, now when you look out, you know, I can't even tell you how many practitioners there are in the variety of communities. Um, you know, there's uh, at least three or four in my own community in the interior and then more as you move out. And so, you know, this has really become a movement to revive ancestral skin marking all across, you know, Turtle Island. And it's really exciting to be at a place where you don't know everybody. It's nice to be in that place where, you know, when you go to a gathering, whether that's in Tayandanega in Mohawk territory, or whether that's a gathering uh, here somewhere in, in British Columbia, or somewhere in, uh, you know, in the U U.S., it's, uh, you know, you just don't know everybody. So it's really exciting time. And I would say that <clears throat> it's even hard to imagine or to even think about or quantify how many people are actually doing the work. And we're in really a, an exciting time as we develop uh, this skin marking practice for each community and culture. And for me, it would be important to have my goal <clears throat> or my dream, sorry, has been to have, uh, you know, at least three ancestral skin markers for each culture and community um, just to be able to give that work. Um, so yeah, it's a powerful, important process that's been happening and developing since this time. Excellent. And so what are you finding um, as an impact on the other community members when they're starting to get <clears throat> tattooing? Is it giving them a better sense of belonging? What, what kind of positive impacts are you seeing in your um, communities that are helping the youth and feeling more grounded? Can you share some specific stories to that? Well, I won't really share any of those uh, specific stories just because those are their stories Personal. to tell. Um, uh, I do have maybe permission to share one story. I have an elder that came to me and he actually got tattooed when he was in residential school. And so we actually covered up his residential school tattoos. You know, I did one maybe back in 2017. We covered the one on his uh, right arm, I believe. And then we covered up just this past month, the one that was on his left arm. And when we finished that, he looked at uh, my mom who was visiting uh, with me while we were doing that work. And he said to her, I'm done with that place now. So, you know, even, you know, not even thinking about our youth, but thinking about our elders, the impact that this work is having on them and the experiences that they had with colonization. And I would say it's an important question to also bring back to how the work is so grounding to our community members, because when we look at the Indian Act, it was actually a act to erase us from existence. You know, the colonial project was to erase us out of existence as Intlakutmuk people connected to a territory, connected to a land, uh, so that that land could be used in the colonial project for resource extraction, for settling of settlers in different communities and on that land. And so uh, that is where we find ourselves, you know, really out of balance, I would say, as Indigenous people. And so when you wear a mark on your face, on your arm, and you, like Corey said, you look down and you realize who you're connected to. 
you know, for Northwest Coast people, they know the clan, the family that they're connected to. They know the story of where that crest came from. And that connects you not only to today, but back into the past. And when it connects you back into the past, in the present, it also connects you to a future, a future that is bright, that you can see how powerful, you know, we were positioned as savages, you know, at one time. And so when you realize how beautiful these, you know, when you look at that painted clothing that's uh, being shown in the gallery, you know, you see how powerful your people were. You can tell the story that was told in that, uh, on that piece of painted clothing from my community. And so, uh, yeah, it really does help to ground us into our cultures, our communities, give us a true sense of our identity and having that true sense of identity helps us to envision a future. Because a lot of times it's when we can't see a future that is beautiful, that is powerful and that is hopeful is when we decide to exit. And so this work helps us to have that ever constantly within us. And it also helps because you can see those in your community who you're connected to. You can look at that pattern and you know, oh, well, you know, you're of the Raven clan or you're of, you know, the frog clan or whatever that may be. Um, and so that connects you back to your community. There's always a visual cultural reminder of how powerful, beautiful and amazing your culture and community is. So that connection is very healing. And oh. uh, I think that was a very powerful video you showed of even that Maori woman getting the, the cultural tattoo. So it doesn't matter where the culture is across the globe. It's got that same transformative effect. Yeah, that's quite powerful. I love that saying that um, uh, Corey Bullpit said, using something old to fix a new problem. I think that's a very powerful statement as well. Now, when the potlatches were um, banned in history, I know it was also a time when tattooing was banned and skin markings. And um, from what I've, I've read and learned is that some of the jewelry, you started to put the crest on jewelry because that was sort of the, the safe way to um, identify your, your different tribes and clans. So was there anything else that um, your people did to try to, to make any markings? Like you had mentioned also the basket weaving. So some of the markings and the sort of motifs and symbols in the basket weaving, did that come about because of the ban of tattooing or was that always sort of inter um, spursed into your culture all along? Yeah, you know, I always, uh, it's a valuable question to bring forward because it highlights the reality that, you know, the painted clothing, the basketry, you know, you can see in the gallery, there's photos of pictographs, which were painted with ochre on rocks. Um, you know, all of those things were actually connected as a visual language. So you can see the connection of the pictograph to the tattoo design, to the uh, basketry design and then on to uh, painted clothing. So all of those things were actually a visual language and that's you know important to bring forward because a lot of people, communities will say, well, we don't have a lot of documentation about our tattoos. And so I always bring forward, well, it's really, it doesn't matter that you don't have documentation of your tattoos because you have documentation of your visual language. So you have to go to those baskets. You have to go in the contemporary time to the pictographs, to the painted clothing, to the clan crest carvings and find that inspiration for those, uh, that movement forward. And so, you know, like you were sharing uh, in the, uh, in that transition period, those bracelets were worn to share the clan and the crest story and they were easily be able to take it off you know, uh, when the missionaries came around. And so it just shows for me the, uh, what would you say, the resilience of Northwest Coast people in keeping their culture uh, secret and keeping it alive in a way that allowed them to live in the contemporary world that they lived in, but also keep that culture safe. And so it's like uh, Dean Hunt says, you know, those markings have always been there. They just went under the skin for a while. And now mm -hmm. it's our job to bring them forward and to highlight them uh, so that they can come to the surface just because they've been sitting there dormant under the skin for a generation or two. Um, and yeah, it's powerful uh, testimony of the 
the resilience and the brilliance of Northwest Coast uh, communities and ancestors who kept that stuff alive, you know, using jewelry. I also love that comment that you made from Nikita about talking how the creator is what gave everybody that visual language about that form line de design, the Ovid shapes and such. And um, does every different Northwest Coast uh, clan or nation have their own form line design? I'm assuming that everything is, every nation's got a slightly different variation. They have their own visual language, their own symbols that they use, and that's part of your identity and, and, and how you identify from each other. Yeah, um, you know, I can't speak too much about it, but I think the reality is, from what I understand, that each community has its own, uh, you know, uh, formal understanding of their own language, the visual language, uh, you know, those who can read it, can look at it and know where it's from. You know, I can't do that. I don't have <laughs> those gifts and I don't have those rights and relationships and responsibilities to those designs, symbols and motifs. But, you know, people who uh, know, they know and they can look at it and they'll know exactly where that's from. And sometimes even who, you know, uh, who taught that person, etc. So yes, those things were all connected, uh, you know, in their own visual language. Okay, good. I also loved your uh, explanation about cultural appropriation on rights, responsibilities, and uh, relationship. And I think that's such a beautiful way that you explained on that if the respite, rights and responsibilities to who who owns that design and who can share that design and as a t tattoo practitioner, that if you want to gift one of your um, tattoo designs, your cultural traditions to somebody, that's your right and your responsibility. But I, I, I ask, if you do gift somebody that uh, cultural tattoo and tradition, what is their responsibility for wearing it? I would say that, uh, you know, they have to wear it in the way that it was intended. And that is really, you know, shared through that experience of wearing it, you know, um, you know, I offer uh, the contemporary intercutmuck blackwork designs that I've been developing from my ancestral visual language to people, no matter your race, culture, community, but ask that you wear that understanding that is an embodiment of the resilience of intercutmuck people. You know, that is your uh, uh, that is your responsibility to walk in the world and to share the story of the beauty and the power of Intlacatmuk and Interior Salish peoples. Um, and that's from my own perspective, my own understanding of, you know, sharing that, you know, uh, we went through this time where, you know, our populations were reduced by, you know, 50, 70, 80%, and we are here. And this is actually a celebration of those struggles that our ancestors went through. And so that is the responsibility of those people wearing those marks, regardless of where they come from. And then, of course, um, when Intakat Mok or Interior Salish people wear their own design symbols and motifs, you know, it's a further embodiment of that resilience and a celebration of that. Excellent. <clears throat> I also liked your comment, when you know better, you do better. So I'm hoping that with this exhibition and all the wonderful work that the five of you are doing, that um, it'll help better educate people in having a better understanding about cultural tattooing, about not culturally appropriating your your imagery and just taking it and wearing it as, it own, as, as their own, because it really is theft. It really is... Um, uh, you know, uh, misappropriation of, of, of these images. But uh, for people who are viewing this exhibit, what can they walk away with to do better? You know, to know better, to do better. I mean, there's enough information to know what not to do, but how can we keep this conversation going after this exhibit is down? Well, I think one of the things that you could do is have conversations with people that are culturally appropriating, you know, uh, and I don't necessarily mean the people that are wearing those marks, because again, maybe they didn't know better at the time, mm -hmm. but there are people who are doing these design symbols and motifs uh, who are non-Indigenous, who are non-Northwest Coast, and who are doing that work, and I would say making bank or making a lot of money off of these mm. cultural markings. And so maybe it's time to number one, have conversations with those people. And number two, don't get tattooed by them. 
So yes, there is power in all of these design symbols and motifs. And if you would like to embody them, you know, uh, find a indigenous Northwest coast practitioner to do that work for you. If that's the design symbols and motifs you want and, or commission an indigenous artist to design a tattoo for you, which then you can take, you know, to whoever to get done, as long as that design was uh, created by somebody who has rights relationship and responsibility to it. You know, so I think that that is the, you know, the most basic steps of understanding these things is don't get, uh, I would say, you know, uh, to be a bit cheeky and to use a bit of uh, colorful language is don't steal people's shit, you know, like just don't do it. Don't go to people who are doing it. Don't support people who are doing that work that they don't have rights relationship and responsibility to. And then I would also say is continue that conversation that revolves around it is a continuation of a culture of genocide. It is connected to the theft of land. It is connected to the stealing of children and putting them in residential schools. It is the uh, erasure of our connection to all of those cultural pieces. And so continue that difficult conversation of how do we move forward as a community? How do we move forward as a country and uh, do the right thing in terms of the land and all of those rights, relationships and responsibilities we have as Indigenous people to our lands and territories. So, you know, it's a larger thing than just the design symbols and motifs. It's land that is stolen and that is unseated, you know, all through British Columbia. And then, you know, truly honoring those treaties that were signed at the time they were signed and honoring them in the spirit that they were signed with. And uh, if they were done in, you know, bad faith, then it's time to revisit those in good faith. Um, so it's, you know, not just the design symbols and motifs. These are just the things that we see today that are beautiful. And but they don't people don't want to visit the horrible, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, those Dark parts history. that aren't beautiful, you know. Yeah. So, you know, teach yourself, understand those things. You know, uh, what is that true history and what are these con things connected to? Um, yeah. So there's a lot of work to be done in those places. But yeah, stop going to people who are stealing, you know, indigenous artwork uh, because, you know, maybe they don't want to stop doing it. Maybe they're making a good living off of it. Um, but you don't have to support them. Go support an indigenous artist, uh, tattoo artist, cultural tattoo practitioner or an artist to do a commission for you. Right. Thank you. Well said. Um, I just have one last question to ask you before we wrap up. Uh, this is a uh, fantastic work that you and the four others are doing. Uh, Dean Hunt, Nikita Trimble, um, and uh, Corey Bullpit. Can you just tell me how you chose those other four artists as part of this exhibition? Um, the reality is, is that there was only a few of us doing the work at that time. Um, and then I would also say that it was also more restricted to the Northwest Coast because that is the mandate that the Bill Reed Gallery has. Okay. So we specifically had to uh, pick artists from the Northwest Coast. And then I was added, you know, as a counter example to the Northwest Coast to show a little bit of a cultural difference between those communities and cultures and my own. And so those artists were chosen because of their connection to the Northwest Coast and the Bill Reed Gallery's mandate to highlight uh, Northwest Coast art. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dion, for shedding so much light on uh, the rights, responsibilities, and relationships to cultural tattooing. We've appreciated your talk. This will be aired on our YouTube station uh, for all the people that have missed this. And uh, we are so thankful and so grateful to have had you uh, amongst us to be able to do the virtual tour. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate everyone who uh, patched in and who will have a look later. I uh, thank you for bringing this important work and uh, doing that hard work of asking important, difficult questions. Okay. So thank You're you. Welcome. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Dion. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.